We have digested hours and hours and hours of TV to bring you this week's Red News, Blue News. Our regular look at how partisan media outlets bend the stories to the right and to the left. We're going to hone in on a very important topic here, Islamophobia, about how it's manifested in the media. Think of Islamophobia as anti-Muslim prejudice, exaggerated fear and hostility toward Muslims perpetuated by negative stereotypes. And now, let's go to the tape. Tuesday, Fox News, Sean Hannity. And hey, welcome back to Hannity. We are witnessing Muslims on the march in Iraq and well beyond all over the globe. Chaos abounds. And here with analysis to the jihad that's raging worldwide. Jihad that's raging worldwide. This is a theme on some Fox News shows. Fox regularly hands over its megaphone to speakers who warn about the threats posed by radical Islam. What's missing is any semblance of balance. Here's an example from The Five on Wednesday. This is about Christians reportedly having to flee Iraq. Tom, let me ask you about moderate... If there is a moderate Muslim voice out there, do you think that now would be the time for them to speak up? Well, we've been <laughs> waiting for some time, right? Tom is Tom Shalhoub. He's a professional comedian. He was filling in for Greg Gutfeld on The Five, and while I think he's a pretty funny guy, he's pretty much the least qualified person to comment on the prominence of moderate Muslim voices. Why not bring on an actual moderate Muslim voice and ask them? Well, this very issue made headlines this week when Washington Post columnist Dana Milbank wrote about a gathering of conservatives here in D.C. He said the event teemed with anti-Islamist rhetoric that too often sounded just anti-Islam, and that a young Muslim student who spoke up was taunted by the crowd. There was debate about whether he overstated that, but the debate distracted from the very important point the student was trying to make. Watch. We portray Islam and all Muslims as bad, but there is 1.8 billion Muslim followers of Islam. We have 8 million plus Muslim Americans in this country, and I don't see them represented here. Yes, representation is the issue, whether the news is red or blue. Now, speaking of blue, here's what MSNBC's Chris Hayes said about this a day later. And the fact of the matter is, we don't cover, like, Peaceful Muslims just like hanging out, going about their day, like performing surgery or like being accountants. We cover ISIS well, marching through with black flags looking super well, well. terrified. So anyway, we have the red, we have the blue, and now I want to pursue what's actually true with one of Chris Hayes' guests. You just saw her there, Linda Sarsour. She's the National Advocacy Director of the National Network for Arab American Communities. And here in D.C., one of Sean Hannity's guests from that very first clip I played, Brigitte Gabriel, the founder of ACT for America. Let me ask you about a statistic that you brought up at this conference I mentioned in D.C. earlier this week. You said the radicals are estimated to be between 15 and 25 percent, according to all intelligence services around the world. That leaves 75 percent of them peaceful people. Where does that statistic come from? That statistic comes from the combined intelligence of the Australians, the Canadians, the Jordanians, the Israelis, the United States, uh, countries that share intelligence who are now monitoring what's happening in the world today. You're saying 180 also, million to 300 million Muslims are radicals? But you're talking about that fraction out of 1.2 billion people. Now, the majority of 1.2 billion people are peaceful people. They are not strapping bombs on their, on their bodies. They are not going out blowing up people. They don't want to kill people. Nor are the you 15 have to 25 percent. 15 to 25 percent are radicalized. Now, not every single one of them wants to blow himself up, but they either support terrorists who want to blow themselves up, provide them with financing, provide them for money, provide them with logistical support. 15 to 25 percent have been radicalized. Uh, Brian, uh, Miss, Ga uh, Miss Gabriel speaks out of two sides of her mouth. I mean, first of all, she's, in one breath she'll say the West must support moderate Muslims and the moderate Muslims must speak up against uh, terrorism. And in the same breath she'll say uh, peaceful Muslims are ir irrelevant. Miss um, Gabriel needs to make up her mind when it comes to what is radical uh, Islam. When asked by Australian News, she said a radical Muslim is someone who prays five times a day someone who believes in the word of the Qur'an, which is the Muslim holy book, uh, someone who believes the prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is a perfect man. That's basically every Muslim. So I have no uh, idea what she means. And where is the room for moderate uh, is Islam. We need to support moderate Muslims and we work with them. We actually have keynote speakers at our national conference who are moderate Muslims. I had a TV show where we invited them on to be on, the, on our TV show. We want to expose their message, but that's completely different than dealing with terrorism, what I deal with as a terrorism analyst. And uh, that's what we need to discuss. The moderate Muslims, they can organize. Where are their collective voices? Where are the voices of the moderate Muslims? 
I'm speaking. When, when, when girls in, kidnapped by Boko Haram disappear and we still do not know L where Linda, they we are. We hear that quite a bit on Fox News. Where are the moderate Muslims? What's the answer to that question? There are, the, there are people out there that stood up on, on, on Boko Haram, on terrorism, on 9-11. There are national Muslim organizations who continue day in and day out to put out statements. Is the media covering it? I don't have control over the media to cover these stories. And I don't have to prove to anyone that I am an American born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and that I cho my parents chose to come to the United States from living under military occupation in Palestine. And you talk about going into a grocery store in Arlington, Virginia, because you speak Arabic and you understand the culture, and that's where you get your credibility from. I understand the culture, and I speak the language, too. And I've never, ever walked into a grocery store or into a hookah lounge or into a community center or a mosque in this country where people were saying that they wanted to destroy America. We know what is being put out. There has been a study after study of the material that have been found in different mosques across the country. A research after research, and these are factual research that have been presented to our government. Do you do so, terrorism? Are you a terrorism analyst on terrorism in general? Um, what about the Las Vegas shooting, the manifestos, the Oak Creek shooting, where white supremacists walked into a gudwara and killed six people? Terrorists is, are terrorists. Ter terrorists are terrorists. Well, I immigrated to the United States, and I continued having the Middle East as my focus and that's what I talk about we are dealing Linda with a radical Islamic element that wants to wreak havoc on the United States there are cars driving in New York right now testing for uh, uh, biological or chemical uh, agents in the air to make sure that nothing has been detonated 24 hours a day in New York City in Chicago in major cities in the United States trying to protect the country but will we not that look is back something we need to discuss and will we with. not look back at this era as a gross over reaction to a terrorist threat that is not there in the way you're describing it to be? The terrorist threat has been there, Brian, for years. America has been attacked under different administrations since 1979 by radical Islamists, whether we had a Democrat or a Republican And by people office. who have twisted Christianity into their own beliefs oh, as oh, well. I agree with you. I agree with you. There are extremists on both sides. But when you look at radical Islam, the country is safe all these years since September 11th because our great protectors and first responders and FBI have put programs in place to protect us and they are watching over the country that's why we are safe Linda do you feel there are specific examples of times where the media has fanned the flames of misunderstanding about Islam absolutely I mean let's look at the Boston bombing the first front page story came out on the New York Post of two young Algerian boys with book bags calling them the bag men Immediately when a incident happens in this country that includes someone who just happens to be of an Arab country of origin or Muslim, we immediately start talking about terrorism and domestic terrorism. And when we have uh, the same cases, similar cases, shootings almost every week in this country where dozens of people are being killed at the hands of guns and lax gun control, I'm more worried about getting shot by a, by a gun or by a shooter in the U.S. than I am from a terrorist attack. Uh, the, the media oftentimes, including uh, Fox News in particular, who actually does hit series on people like me for standing up and, and speaking my mind and practicing my American patriotism, uh, the media does ha play a role in this, but it also gives, again, the platform to people who are pseudo-experts. And just because you grew up in the Middle East and just because you supposedly lived under a war, does it make you a terrorism analyst? Um, there are people who have uh, extensive training in this area and at the same time can talk about very fringe Islamic terrorism without talking about Islam as a religion uh, being a threat, a re the fastest growing religion in the country. And what Ms. Gabriel and her friends don't say is that many of the foiled plots that uh, in this country have been foiled by information that came directly from the community, in some cases even the immediate family members of those uh, who were uh, alleged uh, to uh, be organizing a terrorist attack or traveling to places like Pakistan and, and others. We're talking about, as two Americans, about how we can protect our country. We are both faced with an enemy wishing both our destruction. When those people attacked the World Trade Center, they wanted to kill Americans, Muslims, Christians, and everybody. When, when Zazi or Shazad wanted to blow up Times Square or the New York subway system, they were planning on killing Americans, teenagers, people taking the subways back to work or back home. Home. They wanted to kill all of us. When you're talking about plots of mass scale, somebody parking a car about to explode in Times Square, or want to blow up the subway system in New York, or want to blow up the Sears Tower in Chicago, we're talking about the mass killing of 
thousands of Americans, if not millions. That is what we need to be discussing and how we can protect but the country. To, to, doesn't that, isn't that fear-mongering? To use the words like thousands and millions, isn't that fear-mongering? The, the idea here is that you want to talk about terrorism, let's talk about terrorism, but let's be prepared. But let's not prepare the American people that all terrorism that happens around the world comes from the Muslim community. That's the, that's the, th that's the point that I want to debate with you here. Well, the is that the idea here that terrorism is a seri serious issue, but terrorism does not equal Islam, it does not equal Muslims. I, I am from New York, I live in New York, I was here in New York on 9-11, Ms. Gabriel. I understand the impact that 9-11 had on communities in New York City. I could have been in the World Trade Center, I could be dead here today. There were Muslim responders, there were Muslims, 75 Muslims died in 9-11, in including a first responder, Salman Hamdani. So I want you to understand that if you want to combat terrorism, you need to work within the Muslim community. You need to make sure that we are part of that discussion. And the, quote, moderate Muslims that you're talking about, which are almost every Muslim living here in this country, uh, need to be part of this discussion. But to alienate the Muslim community, create them as the other, and to start uh, making over-exaggerations about these potential attacks that haven't happened uh, is not the way that you combat terrorism uh, in any country, and especially not here in the United States, in a country where I can live here and speak freely, you can stand there and speak freely, and that's the kind of country that I want to live in, and I want to be part of the discourse. And we want to make sure we protect this country, and we do work with a lot of moderate Muslims, like I said, who even come and speak at our national conference. What we're talking about now, Islamic terrorism, when, when you're watching the news this morning, and you're hearing about terrorists in Syria, in Jordan, in Lebanon, at Boko Haram, in Sudan, in Nigeria, in Chad, in Libya, I, I can go down the list. Every single instant when you're watching the news, it's not Buddhist terrorists, it's not Christian terrorists. Yes, there are some crazy people who commit terrorism, but right now the terrorism on mass scales, the bodies piled up, the people being beheaded, even Muslims shooting other Muslims, like what we watched in Iraq, because they did not believe them that they were Sunnis. That is barbarism on a mass scale, and that's unacceptable in civilized society. As long as you clarify and you stand up and say that the fringe extremists of any faith are only a tiny minority in the larger faith, this is what we want you to talk about. When you talk about Islam and you talk about the Quran, 1.4 billion people across the world follow the word, word of the Quran. You just got to make sure that you're being specific when you talk about terrorism of any faith, but more specifically, Islamic terrorism. They're not waiting uh, to hear your opinion or my opinion. They want to kill us both. And this is why we must discuss how we can defeat the radicals who want to kill us, who are using the Quran as their source and justification for their murder. Why are we having this discussion? If, if you and I are irrelevant, why the discourse? Why the debates? Why the analysis? Exactly. We are irrelevant. Because right now, what we need to be talking about is how we can defeat the radicals. I'm going to wrap it there. We could go on and on, but I do have to leave it there. Linda Sarsour and Brigitte Gabriel, thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is